Project Sky Crane maneuver. Today's video has been sponsored by World of Warships, but more on that in a moment. The topic we're covering today on Space Dock is the return of the Sky People in Avatar The Way of Water, focusing on the ISVs. The first shot of their return shows their super bright plumes from the surface of Pandora, and extremely powerful engines like these probably would be that visible with just one ISV, let alone 10 of them. This is also the majority of RDA's fleet of 12 ISVs, though they certainly could have made more since the first film. How they all ended up arriving simultaneously is a different problem, which I will cover after talking about today's sponsor, World of Warships. This free-to-play game is available on PC and consoles, with new content released every month, from ships to nations to cosmetics, there's always something to check out. This September, the game is celebrating its 8th birthday with legendary metal band Megadeth. For this month only, you can play as Vic Rattlehead or Dave Mustaine, or equip these themed skins on your ships as you take on 7 different game modes with 5 classes of ship at your disposal. Take out stealthy destroyers, versatile cruisers, tanky battleships, long-range aircraft carriers, or even sneaky submarines into co-op or player versus player. If you're really competitive, there's also ranked games and clan battles to engage with. No matter what you choose to play as, you can battle across 40 unique maps with dynamic weather and updated with new water effects and textures for your vessel to cut through or under. Download the game with the link in the description or pinned comment below, and if you're a new player then use the promo code MEGADEATH to get a starter pack with 200 doubloons, 500,000 credits, 7 days of premium account time, and a Vic Rattlehead commander and ship. Now back to the ISVs, which are supposed to leave Earth using a huge laser sail, but that bit of lore might have been forgotten about. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say it was used, with the departing ships sent off at different velocities so they'd all line up for a dramatic arrival all at once. They then discard their debris shields, which look like they've only got one layer like in the first movie. The lore for these craft says they have four of these to act as a whipple shield, and the new visual dictionary for the first film even showed the model that had four, so I was hoping they'd rectify that for the sequel. The ISVs then do the really wild thing that made them stand out in the movie and drop down into the atmosphere. I saw a lot of people confused about this as they'd assumed the structure would burn up on atmospheric entry, but as I mentioned in last week's video, they can slow down before they even touch air. Those engines are big honking massa antimatter beasties with a hydrogen afterburner that run at 1.5 g in vacuum. They certainly have enough thrust to hang the entire craft like this in Pandora's 0.8 g. The real issue is that they're equivalent in power to continuously exploding nuclear bombs. In vacuum, this isn't an issue because all that energy is in the thrust plumes, but in atmosphere, those plumes are hitting the air. They would be creating enormous shockwaves that would obliterate the craft. There's also the problem of the hideous amount of radiation the engines spew out in every direction from the matter-antimatter annihilation. This is largely dealt with in vacuum by putting the habited section of the craft far away from the engines. In air though, scattering causes the radiation to go everywhere, including back into the craft. At least the landing modules have exterior panels to protect against this. The exhaust is also as hot as a star, chock full of gamma rays and subatomic particles that would turn Pandora's surface into radioactive lava, but at least the devastation they cause to the forest is spot on. What is really cool though is seeing the ground and ocean turning to vapour and being blown away from the places the plumes touch, though it would probably be an awful lot more pronounced than depicted. The landing modules containing vehicles and personnel being delivered on a massive cable are really cool. Calling it the sling load system like a helicopter rather than a sky crane like the Mars rovers is kinda lame though. One thing that perplexes me about the lore is that these modules with troops and dozers were followed up on with ones containing construction equipment and prefab structures. But how do they land safely if this is what happens? Surely they can't land at the same place because they would wipe out the previous landing. Maybe they deploy from much, much higher up on longer cables, or they get dropped off at different landing sites. After all that, RDA built Bridgehead as a permanent colony, done very rapidly using hordes of construction robots. One thing I want to mention is this odd structure in the bay that goes suspiciously unlabeled in the visual dictionary, which I think might be the surface connection location for a future space elevator. Now this is 100% speculation, but it would make sense for RDA to want to set one up, though it might be impossible due to Polyphemus and its other moons. That area could also just be some reclaimed land, I suppose. Whatever the future plans of RDA, they are very likely to be just as brutal and destructive to the native life as their re-arrival was, and that was a true moment of shock and awe. Oh yeah, did I mention that the lead ISV for the invasion was called the Manifest Destiny? Make of that what you will. 
Thanks for watching. Remember to check out the links below for World of Warships and to use code MEGADEATH for the free currency, premium time, and ship. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.